At this point, I've done quite a few of these videos, and I wanted to take some time to go over the events that I've established so far in my narrative. I'm telling the whole story of my incarceration, and it was a lengthy one. I want things to be as little confusing as possible, so I'm going to start whenever I was arrested. On October 5th, 2001, I was arrested for the murder of child pornographer and serial child molester Donald Perez. He had traveled to my rural community of Fort Bragg, California, on the Mendocino coast, with the intent of taking photos and probably molesting a young boy with whom I was acquainted. My co-defendant, August Stuckey, whenever questioned regarding the murder of Donald Perez, had told investigators that I had killed him because I hated gay men and I knew that Donald Perez was gay. August had left out the fact that Donald wasn't attracted to men, he was attracted to children, because it didn't suit his narrative. He was trying to muddy the waters and hopefully avoid prosecution entirely. This was in the aftermath of the Matthew Shepard case, and I lived in a very liberal community. The possibility that I had committed an atrocity against somebody based upon their sexual orientation was sure to get people angry and it did work. The local newspapers, the Ukiah Daily Journal and the Anderson Valley Advertiser ran lengthy and horrific articles regarding my case based primarily on August's narrative. This wouldn't have been so bad, but the judge in my case, Judge Lehan, recused himself from overseeing the case because of a personal relationship he had with myself and my co-defendants because it was a small town. We were tried in the small town of Ukiah instead, where some of the negative publicity had ran, and it very, very negatively impacted my likelihood of a fair trial. I appealed to have my case moved to a neutral county, Sonoma perhaps, and after that was turned down and my co-defendant Ty was convicted of the murder of Donald Perez, receiving a sentence of life without the possibility of parole, I took a plea bargain, agreeing to serve 19 years and 8 months in the California Department of Corrections, rather than risk the possibility of a sentence like Ty had received. I started my prison sentence at San Quentin State Prison. I was transferred there on July 11th, 2002. It was a difficult time. I did make it through just fine. It was a reception center and I was there about a month. I stuck my nose in people's business a couple of times and I like to think that I, I helped, that I made the prison a better place, I guess is how you'd express it, or at least I made it so somebody didn't get hurt as much as they might have. By and large, what I did was risk my neck to no effect and I got out of there probably just before it was all going to come back and bite me in the ass. I arrived at High Desert State Prison a couple, of weeks a couple of weeks after I arrived at San Quentin, and it was a whole different program. My Sully Blinky introduced me around, and it turned out that I knew somebody at the prison. I had a homeboy, somebody who had grown up in the same community as I did, and we had mutual acquaintances. His name was Vertigo, and he was a skinhead. He really looked out for me tough. He made sure that I was okay where I was at, that I understood how things worked. He walked me around the yard and introduced me to all of his skinhead friends. And that was, the rub of it was his skinhead friends, because Vertigo was a skinhead. And I didn't share his belief system, and I rapidly got uncomfortable hanging out with him. Before I had an opportunity to resolve this paradox that I liked the guy, though I didn't like the group he was a part of, he ended up going to the hole because they caught him with a piece. A couple of days after Vertigo went to the hole, Derek came by. Derek was another skinhead, and he was a decent guy. I always had a lot of respect for Derek. He came by and let me know that they'd gotten word from Vertigo and that he was alright, and he was doing fine in the hole, and the fellas knew him back there. And Derek thought that I'd want to know that, and I did. I was glad that things were going to be okay for Vertigo. Derek checked real quick, made sure that I didn't need a couple of soups, that I was getting along with everybody, and he moved along. 
Derek had always struck me as the perfect example of somebody who actually embodies the ideals that the gang that are a member of claims to stand for. It had been suggested to me that I should get out of the corner that I was in, in cell 202, because there were very few whites in the area, and if a riot kicked off, my celly and I would be outnumbered drastically. A couple of months later, Derek and his celly actually moved into the corner that I had moved out of, using the same logic. He said, well, there aren't many whites over here, and if something kicks off, they're going to need a couple of guys to help get them out of this nasty corner and to where the fellas are grouped. That is self-sacrificing and noble logic, and logical, too. It was actually a good way for him to utilize his resources for the gang. I had expected that Vertigo would have told Bull that he didn't want to live with me and I didn't want to live with him, that it just wasn't going to happen. But the next day, whenever I was out walking on yard, I found out that it wasn't the case, that Bull was still under the impression that he and I were going to live together. He came up and told me he was ready to get the paperwork started on that move. I walked a lap or two with him, and I expressed to him that I just didn't want to live with him, and I didn't mean any discourtesy, but the idea that he and I were going to live together hadn't come from me. I'd never agreed to it. He was polite, respectful, but I could tell he was working with hurt feelings. At the age of 20, I don't think I quite understood what was going on, but Bull was sniffing around. He was trying to figure out if I was a viable sexual candidate. And looking back, it would have been better if I had been firm from the first time that I spoke to him. But I was confused, and all I really knew was that he was making me uncomfortable with the way that he was speaking to me, that him calling me son publicly had just been weird as heck, and that I knew I wasn't going to live with the guy if I felt that way, because he was, he was being a little aggressive, and that is not the way that anybody should approach somebody they don't know for any reason. I had planned that I was going to approach Bull in the next day or two, you know, try and mend fences, maybe offer to make him a meal, or hang out and play a game of cards or something. That was before that evening, whenever my Sally Blanky approached me and said something to the effect of, so I hear you don't want to live with me anymore, that you're looking around for a new Sally. I had a guess Bull had had a conversation with him, hoping that Blanky was going to decide he didn't want to live with me anymore, and... I'd have to go somewhere, and that was exactly how it worked out. Blinky and I had a, a short and not even heated disagreement, but it, it ended with him expressing clearly that I was going to be moving out of the cell because he was a porter and he knew the cops and he'd been there first, so I was going to be leaving. I'd better find some place to go. I was not going to be moving in with Bull. I had a friend downstairs whose celly was paroling, John and I figured that if I hit him up, I could move down there in three days when his celly paroled. If that didn't work, I, I could just hit up the cops and play the celly lottery. They'll generally just say, okay, well, we'll move you in with the next cell that opens up, and good luck. And good luck is definitely preferable to moving in with some weirdo that's really manipulating the system in a weird way to get me to live with him. This was the beginning of a reasonably stressful time for me. And I remember, because this was also at the end of a stressful time for me at San Quentin, and a stressful time for me whenever I'd been fighting my case, really just being ready to throw my hands up in the air and say, you know, I, I can't do prison, I can't do 19 years of this, I, I can't do 19 weeks of this. It was dark. And they say it's always darkest before the dawn. I remember thinking that, that, you know, maybe if I, I just looked at the horizon... I could see that sun start to peek over and know things were going to get easier. But you can't be Pollyannish about this type of thing. Sure, it's always darkest before the dawn, but you, sometimes it's just dark. Sometimes there's no dawn coming. So what should you do? Just keep watching that horizon and praying maybe it'll work out? That's what I'm going to do. Hell yes, that's what I'm going to do. The sun's coming or it isn't. It's darkest before the dawn, or it's just dark. I don't know how that story's going to end, but I know where I'm going to be when that story ends. That's on my feet, fighting, watching the horizon. I hope we'll see you there.